big range. Yeah. Nice, nice, big, nice big range. Hold on. Let me, let me put my headphones in. Yeah, well, you know, this morning we we're kind of focused on this, the 200 day of the NASDAQ bonds. Hold that. Hold that. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this morning we were focused on the 200 day and the NASDAQ bonds. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now you've got, um, you know, the, the names that led the up were Visa and Microsoft. Where did I put my Microsoft? I mean, Home Depot's blown off. CME saw some. Profit taking, you. Yeah. yeah. Where's Microsoft? Microsoft, you got the ORL stops here. You just got the ORL stops and the minis and the in the S and P's, and uh, you just got them in the Russell too. So now I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, me neither. I guess we'll have to wait for the next tweet. <laughs> you know, you had a decent bounce in the gold. I mean, I, I was looking at the pit. Um, SEP 30 year, which basically, you know, just got, it didn't even get half of the gap. Yeah. So I thought that the bonds were going to get a little lower this morning. Um, <clears throat> no, I thought there was a chance we came down and retest this breakup from the end of the month. Uh, we're nowhere close. Yeah, you know, I, uh, so the bonds are the bonds are tough because of the, I mean, with all the conversation coming from the White House, that's the smallest part of it. It's now you got uh, you've got a lot of analysts who are pushing back against the uh, the concept of a cut. I am. Mean, I was listening to the background noise of CNBC, and it seems to be uh, picking up some traction and I can't I tell you whether it's right or wrong. You know, uh, nobody knows whether it's right or wrong. Nobody. Uh, the market may have well got very, may have got very far ahead of itself, of course, with this, but uh, um, on the concept of a cut and how much the cut is baked in and, uh, I, I actually disagreed with Santelli's analysis this morning, very, his initial analysis, then it got better. And then of course, Joe Kernan had to throw out a wise guy comment that ended the conversation, which was going to bleed into the interest on excess reserves, which is the most important conversation they have. And even Leesman was admitting that, well, yeah, it had an impact because that's, that's what the, the issue really becomes. And can the Fed cut rates? Everybody's focused on the Fed funds, and I myself with the Fed funds contract. But if they actually move to cut uh, rates on the on the interest on excess reserves by a sizable amount, uh, of course they 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 Leesman had it wrong. Interest on excess reserves is not higher than the Fed funds rate. Um, at least not the, the official rate. The market rates may be trading a little bit differently, but that's a, that's a very important issue going forward here. So, uh, but of course that killed the conversation. It takes one, one idiot remark and they actually were getting into some interesting things, but that, that killed it. Um, and then that's really it, but there is, there is a lot of, uh, now there's a lot of push, uh, pushback on this concept of the, uh, uh, and the concept of the Fed uh, actually not moving at all and just to be very patient here. So, uh, which is why we saw the curves flatten uh, somewhat this morning. And now they're, they're, they're still flattening, but not to the extent that they were. So just really time to pay attention to, uh, 
to the board. Um, any questions before uh, any issues burning? I got a question, Iris Pete Quigley. Hi, Pete. Hey, how's it going? So, you know, the market was set up for a rally, and, and it happened. And, like, this whole question, like, should they raise rates or not? It probably yeah. it doesn't seem like it would really matter, you know. I don't really understand how it matters. You mean, you mean whether they, to cut rates or not? Yeah, well, I, should, I mean, you can make a strong argument either way, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it really matters. Well, they they won't be raising rates. I I I. Yeah, I know. Leave them where they are, or cut them. Leave them where yeah. they are. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and my sense would be cut them, and, and I'll tell you why. And actually, it was either Wall Street Journal or the New York Times picked up the theme, and I think we may have talked about it last week. Uh, Trump has actually kind of trapped Powell here because the Fed's going to wear if the economy were to turn around quickly here because. First of all, every article I've read this morning from last night through this morning talked about the strength in the economy and how the economy is really strong and buoyant underneath. And the jobs numbers are not so good only because they can't find enough workers. So they're OK. So that's that's a, a dominant theme going forward or, or today. Let me say going forward today. So there's a sense that, well, the Fed shouldn't cut rates. But if I was Powell, I would cut rates and I would cut rates, whether it's, I would do it, of course, on my choice would be the interest on excess reserves, just to see how that would impact the market. And I don't mean five basis points, 10, I mean, 50 basis points, 75 basis points. And there is a precedence for the Fed doing that to buy themselves um, some insurance against a potential downturn. And it would, it would get Powell out of the Trump trap because he'd say, okay, we cut. And now we're going to sit here because that's the exact way I would do it. Okay, I'm going to cut. And now we're going to sit here. That's my forward guidance to the market. We may be here for a year, but we're going to see the way this plays out. Because, because Powell is also trapped by the other central banks. You know, they've, everybody cuts and they're all cutting. I mean, Aust Australia just cut. Some people weren't looking for it. I thought that was a mistake. The Japanese are certainly very dovish. The Europeans are more than dovish. Um, and, and so you, you could do it, and it would take some of the upside pressure off the dollar, which is another big theme going on here. Because there was, um, Pete, there was, I don't know whether you guys saw it. I, uh, there was that article on uh, Friday from Bloomberg talking about, uh, I can tell you exactly. I, we don't have to guess here. I have it uh, in front of me. So let me give it to you in its full. The title of the article from Bloomberg on Friday was Trump's currency war plan puts treasury and commerce at odds. And I'm, I'm reading you. A Commerce Department proposal to oppose countervailing tariffs on countries that it determines have devalued their currencies has alarmed officials at the Treasury Department, according to four people familiar with the matter. Of course, they don't name them, and that always makes me suspect. And they continue, they are wary of market disruptions and a politicization of foreign exchange policy, among other concerns. Well... I make this to be a highly uh, important issue, especially if you follow it through with Trump's tweets this morning. I I don't know. Did you guys talk about those that tweet? No, we haven't. We haven't discussed it, Ira. Okay, there was a tweet from Trump this morning. Now, go, now remember, this article was Friday. Trump's tweet this morning was. Hold on. Gotta find it. Uh, oh. Um, oh. Here. It, this is a tweet from Trump. Trump. Uh, well, his, Trump. Uh, this was the headline. Trump Fed rates way too high. Attacks quantitative tightening. Trump Fed interest rates way too high. 
Trump, euro devalued against dollar puts U.S. at disadvantage. But the full tweet from Trump was this. This is because the euro and other currencies are devalued against the dollar, putting the U.S. at a big disadvantage. The Fed interest rate way too high added to a ridiculous quantitative tightening. They don't have a clue. Now, see, this this really, and, and this came out after that article, of course, on Friday. This is this morning's tweet. So it really reflects that Trump is, uh, is going to play with the dollar here. Get ready for it. I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but, you know, as we've talked about, I, I'm shifting away from a weak dollar policy, any, uh, from a strong dollar policy. And, and uh, you can see he's going to politicize this. And he's turning to the Commerce Department, which undermines the Treasury Department. And in my opinion, and I think, it's a, I, I think this is, has a lot to it, by the way. It's just not a... Uh, can you hear that dog barking? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to kill him. Hold what, what, what are you, you, you got is <laughs> chase the cars in the house? I'm at the house. Yeah, yeah I'm in the house. Uh, <laughs> hold on. I, you know, I'd be quiet. Here, so, and I, I've got a Euro Lossy chart up, Ira. Okay. Yeah, but but what he's what Trump is with out question going to do here? He's going to rely on the Commerce Department because we know that the Treasury Department has never, as much as they talk about it, this is a currency manipulator. They've never gone that route. And now that Trump has come under pressure for the overuse of tariffs, he's going to use the Commerce Department to say, hey, these guys aren't playing fair. Uh, they're currency manipulators. And it's going to give them room to start to jawbone the dollar lower. And with him putting pressure on the Fed, that's why if I'm Powell, I would absolutely stone cold cut and go, okay, here, you got it. And now I'm out of the way. We're out of the way. The Fed, the Fed the, we cut because we, we see certain headwinds out there. We're unsure about the trade policies across the globe. We're buying some insurance. We're going to sit here. We're not cut. This is it. This is all you're getting. This is what the market. So prepare yourself and then trade accordingly because that's what you've got. Because the market. So uh, the 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 issue is is that and Trump is definitely going to politicize the dollar, and he's not the only one. Again, we go back to. Uh, uh, Senator Warren last week, you know, with her, uh, what's the exact phrase that she uses? I know. Um, I don't know whether she uses this phrase. So she said she would, she put forth as a, a policy of actively managing the value of the dollar. Uh, and it would looking to promote exports and domestic manufacturing. She's, so she's, she's, really up on, she's really up on her economic history, isn't she? Well, you know, it, actually, that's her strong area. And even Tucker Carlson, I, you know, he, he's got that YouTube that, of the eight minutes he did with her talking about her understanding of economics. And I'm not going to disagree with that. I think if she has a strong suit, it's that she understands New York and the financial industry very well, very well. Um, and she did before all this before she became a senator, because when she used to be on, Bloom on uh, Bloomberg or CNBC, she would really actually talk very intelligently and knowledgeable about the banking system. So, uh, so that is her strong suit. So she's staying away from social policy and actually trying to, to go after what Trump has been trying to do. That's why that dollar statement uh, was very important. And, if she, and according to the polls, she's actually moving up and and believe me, Trump is paying attention to that because she's kind of stealing his thunder. So watch the conversation ramp up here about the dollar being too strong. I, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what Trump, this all fits pretty well together where he wants to go here. And, you know, it's, he can say everybody's manipulating their currency because Wilbur Ross, who's actually the Secretary of Commerce, 
actually made that statement that, hey, we're in a currency war every day. Uh, back in uh, uh, January of 2017, he, he made that comment. And he said, now, now we're going to the ramparts. That was the exact phrase that he used, you know, because they talked about it. And then there was uh, the Ford CEO, Mark Fields, at the, when Trump was having his meetings with uh, uh, corporate executives, and when Mark Fields came out and, and said that uh, currency manipulation was the, was the mother of all trade barriers. Of course, uh, two months later, he was gone from Ford, but it was a, it's an important statement. So watch the dollar rhetoric. That's all I'm saying. I can't tell you. Well, it's happening now. Watch the dollar rhetoric start to ramp up. And that's how he's going to go after. Well, it's, it's how he is going after the Fed. I mean, there was no question about it this morning. Ira, I don't remember which Fed official said it yesterday or today, but they did use the phrase, just as you just did, uh, insurance policy, right? Oh, yeah, I didn't see uh, that, so I can't. Yeah. Just, just cut, you know, we, sh we should cut rates as an insurance policy, right? And, and that yeah. phrase has connotations of common sense, makes you feel good, you know, it's insurance, yeah. so it's protection. Right. And that that could be the cover, you know, that that Powell could be looking for, because otherwise, I don't think personally that Powell will cut anything, right? Unless he's forced to, because the mar the markets do another fourth quarter swan dive. Yeah, yeah, that you know what, I I mean, I, I I that was Matt, right? No, Angela. Good. Oh, Angela, I'm sorry. Um, that's yes, and I and I would sense that because they knew they need to remove themselves from the discussion. You know, I don't I don't quite get with markets up here at near all time highs again that they have to do anything no. by cutting rates. I mean, well, yeah, right. I and and that's what the theme was of the discussions. Hey, you know what? The finance, stock markets are up here. <clears throat> the financial systems are are, are well in order, um, but you do have the markets, and for whatever good or bad, and I'm not talking about stock market. I'm talking about the bond markets and the uh, interest rates markets have really already pricing it in, and a lot of it has to do with what the foreign central banks are doing. So, if you want to wear a stronger dollar. That's really not good because that's going to get Trump more aggressive on the tariff policy. So, you know, that's the way he's got Powell trapped. He's got Powell trapped. It's, and the dollar, it, you know what? It, the dollar may actually rally from that because the, uh, the U.S. is still uh, the best return on, you know, on an interest rate basis than any other major currencies. So. Uh, he can do it, but what happens if the dollar turns around and rally? That, that's the real question. But if he meets what market expectations are, and that's the issue, Judge, that, that I raised, and I think Angelo is reiterating that same thing, is that market expectations being that can, can lead to it. And it would, again, it would remove the Fed from the discussion. And there's, and there's precedence. It's not like he's breaking new ground here. You know, I, I keep citing, you know, the Jerome uh, Curviel uh, cut of 75 basis points on that Martin Luther King holiday back when Sock Gen got in trouble, uh, their trading room. And the Fed cut 75 basis points on, I think, on that Monday, which was Martin Luther King Day or Tuesday, the following, the Tuesday. But they did cut. I mean, you can, somebody can go Google it. I don't, I don't have it up, but it, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's uh, more than pretty sure. But that was when Sock Jen with uh, Jerome Correa was uh, in, in trouble. So he's got room to do that. He's, he, he does have room to do that. And again, it would, it would take some of the pressure. So as, as strong as the stock market is, and we can argue whether the under, underlying fundamentals uh, really support that or whether it's low interest rates, which is going to get you even a stronger stock market. But that's, what, that's the bed they made, and there's nothing they can do about that. If, I mean, if that was a concern of them, then turn around and start raising rates 
and take whatever comes at you. But that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Because to me, the Trump trade policy, and, and that includes the dollar, because the dollar is now part of that policy. Uh, I think the market's slow to take this up, but it's, it's going to gain traction as far as a policy statement. Uh, if they were to raise rates, Trump would throw tariffs on all over the place. That, that would be my guess. So what is Uncle Mario waiting for? Or do you think maybe he's waiting to see what Powell does? He's waiting for the for the wizard to bring him a brain. Oh wait, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, you, you, know, you, you got to give Uncle Mario credit, man. You, like, like you say, Mario the magician, right? I he mean, is, he, he is, you got to give him credit for being a creative Italian. You know what? He he is one of the best three card Monte dealers I've ever seen, and and he can he can dance this, but he is just like you know what. It was interesting listening to, to Druckenmiller. I'm going to digress here a little bit. And who does he point the finger at? Yellen. And I, I would point to more Bernanke, but he doesn't want to get into it. As he openly admits, he's, you know, Bernanke's a bright guy, but Yellen is a very bright woman. But they were both lax in moving when they should have moved. Again, I think the greatest policy mistake made was when uh, Bernanke pulled back in the face of the taper tantrum. Because that's when they should have started doing, you know, and curtailing QE, but he didn't, and he prolonged it a year more than it, than they ought to have. And then uh, Yellen, you know, got nervous in the face of uh, what was going on in China and and other issues in uh, 2015, 2016, and she wouldn't raise rates. And Druckenmiller calls her out for it, and I think that's absolutely right. But yeah, I, I say the same thing about Draghi. This should have stopped long ago, but he couldn't. He couldn't, and he did. And 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 Trump is is right when they or I'll say Wilbur Ross and others when they when they talk about that they use their monetary policy to weaken their currency. Hell, the Swiss National Bank openly admits it. The Australians openly admit it. Read the Canadian uh, the Bank of Canada statement. They all openly admit to this. They all openly admit to this. Uh, you know, they look at their currency. Okay, there was no reason in the world for the Australians to cut rates. No reason in the world. But but that Aussie Kiwi had rallied, so they felt they had a little room. And oh yeah, the trade. But by all measures, their their employment situation is holding up very well. They've got a lot of lo loans out there. There is no reason that they should have cut rates. But they do it because they know it's going to impact their currency in a way that they deem to be beneficial to them. So uh, I I find it so duplicitous when every time, you know, oh, no, it has nothing to do with the currency. It has everything to do with the currency because monetary policy done right affects currencies. And that's and that's responsible monetary policy. And that's a policy that I would call irresponsible when you just keep, keep cutting, 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 and you want your currency to go lower because it's another form of stimulus. The Japanese have been doing this um, for as long as I've been trading. They, they get it, and, they, you know, and now they keep that QE in place for, you know, for a reason. And they know because... Yes, the yen is stuck here between what, 107 and a half and 113 and a half. They like, they like it. They like to have it at 120 right now, I think. But the rest of the world just doesn't let them get there. Um, the Europeans, a lot of what they do right now is absolutely to, to ensure that the currency doesn't go anywhere. If anything, it goes lower, but they may run into Trump here. And this may, uh, there's enough short euro currency positions out there that if Trump really starts getting active, you could really see a, 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 a move up. You know, you mentioned Japan. And yesterday, Kuroda said, well, you know, we still have more tools. And I, right, I, right. I, yeah. right. <laughs> and I mean, I just sit there and I laugh as if, like, these central bankers, Ari, you know this. I got most of this from you anyway. 
it's they, they sit there and make us believe that these so-called tools are are actually real things as opposed to just money printing which is what it all is anyway in one yeah. way shape or form it's all money printing okay but they but yeah. they couch it as as being a, a particular type of strategy with a brand new acronym Yep. Right. And, and, if, and, and if you have tools, then then why haven't you used them? Why are you in the shitter for 20 years? And, and they're so arrogant about it. Each one of them. You know, it, it, the pathetic thing is that when you listen to them, they all have the same speeches. They use the same words. They, really, is monetary policy that unified? Is the global economy is not in sync? Why would you all use the same words? But that's what they do. And you know what? And uh, that I blame on Bernanke because he brought that into the game. And once he started down that road and once he continued, and once he continued, um, uh, down that path of QE unnecessarily, QE, QE, uh, three, two and three, there, there was no question that they all picked up on that. And they go, well, okay, this is good. He's already paved the way. And he has, he's, you know, he has uh, paved the way for them to go down, to go down that road. And, and that's what they've done. They've gone down that road and they all, one, one mimics the other. I've never seen this in my life. I've again, I've been a fed watcher my whole trading life, 42 years. I've watched the other central banks, and I've never seen the synchronicity of words. It's all the same words. It's like they're all, you know, there's a boilerplate now, and they all just copy it and go, okay, let's go from there. <laughs> Ira, Ira, in your 42 years, has there ever been a time where the central banks were under this kind of a microscope, or do you think this current microscope is a result of these extreme measures that the global banks are taking? This is the gift of Alan Greenspan, who, you know, he loved, he loved the focus of, uh, he loved the light being shown on him. He did. He, you know what? He, he became a celebrity. Most people couldn't tell you who the Fed chair was. If they could name the Fed chair, that was it. But once Greenspan, you know, uh, took the, ramped this up, you know, following Volcker, <coughs> Everybody now, you know, now you know uh, everybody. I, I know every central banker in the world. I did before because that was my job. And that was how my edge in the markets. But I laugh that these these guys play out to such a uh, an extreme. I mean, federal, you know, FOMC presidents from the districts. I mean, I can name every one of them. That I couldn't do before. But I, you know every one of them because they're all out there speaking all the time all the time. And somebody told me that's part of their contract now that they want them to be exposed, you know, to be out there that they're supposed to do that. And it also gets them to their next job. Yeah. If I was, a Fed, if I was on the Fed board, which I'm not, but I, I do have, I do have the, I do have the, the resume to do it. Uh, I'd be out there talking too, because you know what? It gets you onto a lot of corporate boards and gets you into high positions when you decide that you want to leave. So, well, how much do you think Citadel's paying Bernanke? Oh God, you uh, yeah. and I don't Citadel's and, not a and public whatever they're company. Paying them is irrelevant to, to to Griffin. Hey, yeah, listen, that, that's, that's absolutely because they get to then bring them out <laughs> to uh, <coughs> you know. They get to showcase him. And, and who doesn't want to hear from Bernanke? Well, yeah, I don't because there's nothing he's going to tell me because he's – honestly, his ability to forecast things, not so good. Now, now to get him to explain to me the plumbing and how everything works, but I'm not sure he knows that. Um, he, he probably does on an academic level, but from a, a, a user level, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but it but it does get them into listen a, a group that everybody in the world should be everybody who's, who's in the financial world should be aware of is the G30. Go go Google that. Go Google the G30 
and see who's on that. And the decision, it's not that they make any decisions, quote unquote, but they, they do impact. They do have a lot of influence and look to see who's on the, on the G30, the, th- the 30 members of the G30. It'll, it'll blow your mind. Even Paul, Paul Krugman is a member of the G30. He, he conveniently forgets to tell you that. Well, let's get back to one other thing. Your, your Russia trade has just been going one way. Yeah, that's the blind pig. No, <laughs> you know, I, I had actually thought that out. And, and, I, and I told you why I thought it made sense, because the oil prices, it was doing it in the face of lower oil prices. So, you know, my sense is that something is going on in the, there. Uh, and yet all the news out of Russia is negative. Although, you know, the, here, I'm, I'm looking at the FT website right now. Russia court orders bearing bus stock to give up bank stake. So th- there's nothing that's really going on. And they arrested, uh, what's his, you know, the guy from, from bearing bus stock. And, and, and you would say, well, th- why would I want to be in here? And yet, you know what? It goes up a percent. It goes up a percent. It goes up. Yeah, somebody called me this morning and said, "Hey, I made four percent." I said, "Yeah, that's it's better than I made on my savings account. I know that." Um, but it's I'm not sure where the where this goes, but there it's doing it in the face of things that it ought not to be doing. And it, you know, Judd, that's what we always learn about: how are things performing, and should they be doing, oh, how the hell can they be doing that? When things are doing things that they shouldn't do, we know that, we know that something bigger is up, right? Can we Hell agree yeah. with that? I mean, and, that, and, and, and the euro, when you were talking about that, that's, that's coming real close here, another 30 ticks, and that's a big breakout on the, on the daily and weekly. I, I know, you know, we're getting up to that 200-day moving average, you know, and, and there are a lot of you know, people out there uh, – spouting that technical level up at 113.70. So you know they're going to push it up there because everybody's looking at it. So the algos for sure will run it through there because that means there has to be enormous stops. You know, even I can figure that out without seeing uh, certain people show up in the pit. Oh, wait, hold on. I, I can't see them in the digital world. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you got the 200 week, you got the 200 day. I mean, yeah. all that stuff's coming into play up here. Yeah, and and it, and again, it ought not to, right? Right. If the Fed is going to back off, if the Fed is going to back off from easy, well, no. Uh, and you got the, and you got the ECB, who's just, I'm telling you, I, what again, you know, and I pick on Draghi rightfully. So yes, he is a master at what he's done. But I'm looking at the bigger picture, and the mess he leaves for whoever takes over that post. Is a is enormous. Now, also, you know, Judd, as I uh, emailed you, the Italian bonds were interesting today because they were the futures were really strong this morning, and then they they had a hundred point break after the uh, well Chicago time, the uh, the Italian bonds close at uh, ten twenty Chicago. So after they closed. They dropped like a hundred uh, pips, which was very significant. Yeah, uh, and it was done because they now the Italians announced they're bringing a twenty-year bond to, to the market. So, uh, oh, look at that. people e- e- emailed me and said uh, that's that's what weakened it because I I couldn't understand what well, what did I miss? <laughs> the, the coupons are going to have IOUs. It's not going to have coupons. It's going to have IOUs attached. Well, listen, I have to tell you something. There are a lot of corporate bonds that are issued the same way. Those are what are called uh, covenants. They're called PICs, payment in kind. I always love bonds like that. And if they miss a, a coupon payment, what they agree to do is to give you more bonds. More worthless oh, no, bonds. That's, that's a big part of, of a lot of the bonds you know, that are – uh, maybe some of them, no, they're not investment grade, <clears throat> but I always said to uh, any of the people who, uh, you know, who managed any kind of money for me, I said, are you nuts? Yeah. Why would I want more, more crap piled on top of crap? They're telling you any company that puts that covenant in their bonds, you don't want to own. 
unless you know something about them, you know, that's really inside. Okay. And you say, okay, I could do that. But here's what they said. The BTB has got a late afternoon blow courtesy of a mandate for a 20 year Euro benchmark sovereign bond. And the weakness could extend into tomorrow's opening. So you're, if you're up tonight, they open up at one o'clock Chicago time, take a look at them. But they had a significant late break because they were strong all morning until that that news about the 20-year bond came out. And the Bunds are starting to pick up against them too again, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Bunds, you know what? Yeah, the Bunds at a negative 23 basis points. Yeah. Right. And, and yet, you know what? I know you get capital appreciation. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I, I do feel vindicated, though, because you know, a lot of people said to me, you know, I'm going to buy, you know, I'm getting out of stocks. I'm buying, buying um, treasuries. I said, don't buy anything more than a five-year, most probably a two-year. And when Druckenmiller said in that uh, CNBC interview that that's what he, he bought all two years. So I said, yeah, it's not bad. He says, I've got, a, I've got 45 points of capital appreciation. You know, the, the bond has gone from 230, you know, and he cited the price on it. Uh, and that's exactly right. So, if I can get that, in fact, if you stayed in the two-year, you got more appreciation than you did in the 10-year because we know that the, the curve actually went out from 15 to 30, steepened out to 30, so there was more at play there. Uh, I think these markets are going to be great because there's so much uncertainty and there's so much uh, back and forth. What's the Fed going to do? What's the Fed not going to do? Um had I been on with Rick this morning, I would have argued with him at the beginning of his um, uh, statement after the PPI, but and I, I would have disagreed with him. But by the end, I, I then I had agreed with him. But this is going to go on and on, and there's a lot of uh, ebb and fl- ebb and flow to this, um, and it's going to remain that way. In the summers, I I don't see these markets really thinning out. I I don't think a lot of people are going to leave this summer. Because there's so much on on the on the on the boil, you got to be you got to be careful. And if you saw the CME volumes last week, you know there was a mistake why the CME stock got up to 204. Those euro dollar option volumes were like insane, and you know a lot of them are on the floor. They're still trading so many on the floor. Uh, they were doing insane volume. Wow. Kevin Hassett was on this morning, and he said he says the economy is going to do probably still three percent this year, and this quarter will be slower. Yeah, I think he was. I think, not, I think he's kind of yeah. accurate. I think he's pretty accurate. But I know you think I know so? he has an essentially yeah, a nature to his job, but still. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe they may hit. You know what? When I, you know, some of the people who I think are are pretty good uh, employment analysts. They think that they think that the underlying economy is really is really that strong. Um, okay, I, again, I have to see it in the wages. The Fed is really going to have a problem if wages were to take off here, and a lot of employment analysts think that wages are going to go up uh, strongly. I, you know what? That one I'm from Missouri. You got to show me. I just don't see where corporations have that type of pressure yet that they have to pay. I, I, I just don't see it. I don't Tradition, see it. Traditionally, when we had these kind of employment levels, you already would have seen it, and it's, it hasn't happened, really. Well, when you say traditionally, how far back are we going to go? That's, that would be my pushback. If we say, uh, you, you know, if we go back to the 70s, I would say, yes, you're right, but I would also argue that labor unions, private sector labor unions, had a lot more power. Well, I'm, I'm agreeing. I, mean, I, I don't think we're seeing the wage inflation that that we would ex, that we would have expected at these levels, and, and that something else is different. And you know, they're, they're, they have hamburger machines they're putting out. If they want a fifteen dollar hamburger yeah. flipper, we'll put a machine in their place. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. That, or we'll move wherever we can. We'll move the jobs and. And because you, you see it, it's universal. Wages in Europe are, as the economists would say, sticky down. Uh, Japan, they're dying for wage. You know, they're getting some, but minimus, you know, because that's, of course, what the BOJ is interested in. So it's a, it's a global phenomenon. And that's because, 
you have a global workforce, you know, and as long as you can move jobs again, let's go back to Mexico. That's where we ended last week. You know what? And, and shame on all of us, you know, cause we talked about it in real time, not, you know, buying KSU judge. You added one ten ten was the 200 day. It held there like to the, to the tick and the pesos come all the way back. I mean, pesos seriously, was anybody, did anybody, was, is anybody surprised that he, he rolled back the 5% increase as of today or yesterday? Well, was anybody are, surprised? Mexico's our best pal in this China problem. Big best pal. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what NAFTA was all about, to counter the Asian influence. So, again, but Mexican, you know, keeping jobs in Mexico, that puts pressure on U.S. corporations. You know, we, we hear about all the truck traffic and the, and the supply chains that are tied into Mexico. Keeps pressure on wages. So until you really see wages go up in Mexico, that would be a real tell to me that then wages will increase in the United States. And you'd say, well, you're crazy. No, I'm not so crazy with that because, again, it's all supply chains. Oh, and, you know, right. where are you assembling it? Where are you producing it? Where, you know, because you, you spend so much back and forth. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to produce this here. I'm going to ship it there. I'm going to put it together here. And it goes back and forth so many times that uh, so, so, it's a big so, part of the global economy. So, Ira, the question I was after we were talking about the economy, you know, we just, the market was really oversold and set up for a rally, and then, then it had these instant algo rallies like it's been doing. Now, are things really good enough to hold it up, or is, is it going to have to keep backing and filling? Yeah, oh, you, no, it's, uh, it's – well, what's tomorrow, CPI? No, it's Wednesday. Oh, it's Wednesday. Yeah, that, that you put a CPI, I think, too. And then we get retail sales on Thursday or for whatever. Um, even though I, you know, because they all keep talking about the consumer, but there are a lot of places where I see that the consumer is, is weak, but then you have, you know, and Peter Bookfire, who I have a lot of respect for, they still talk that the consumer is far healthier than the markets, you know, than, the, uh, than a lot of people out there think. Um, although automobile numbers are down. Although, I, what were they for? I didn't see the May numbers, uh, but I know they're soft because the dealers are offering all kinds of incentives to get you in. Um, uh, so that's soft. Housing, considering how low interest rates are, soft, you know, soft on a relative basis. It's not, it's not bad to where it was, you know, four, five, uh, six, seven years ago, but it's still not, you know, with the drop in rates, you're getting refinancings, but you're not getting a whole lot of um, movement. Well, the so, stuff that's going, Ira, is Rio Tinto, BHP. All these copper miners are all just exploded to the upside. Yeah. yeah. All of them. Well, and, and, and copper traded right with the S&Ps today. When the S&Ps were on their high, copper was on their highs. And now it came after the Chinese. I don't know if you saw that Chinese announcement last night that they had room to do more infrastructure. There was that statement last night. Well, that's what was going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. They said, you know, that there's room for infrastructure, and for, you know, uh, and, and copper then just started rallying. Too bad. You know, I, I, saw, the, I saw the statement, and I, and I said, I don't want to, want to get involved with it because I don't know where the next tweet's coming. Um, but they're in the game now talking about it, too. And, uh, so, so, you know, I, were actually, I was thinking about something yesterday I wanted to ask you. Now that we get to yep. China and they're printing some more money to piss it around and build infrastructure that has no economic return. You know, if, if, if this trade thing, this, is, this thing, if they stop accumulating excess dollars, doesn't, doesn't the efficacy, the credibility of their, their debt system just collapse? Without, without surplus dollars in their system? Yeah, you sound like the White House. That's what they're hoping for because that's what they think their leverage is. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. We, because, again, there's so much we don't know about China. So when we don't know, we think the worst because we think, well, they're you know, hiding this, that, and the other. But we don't know... You know, listen, they've, they've had tremendous growth now for 30 years. So we don't know what a downturn for China looks like. We, we really don't know. And when people say, well, they only have 6.5% growth, 
But as I've argued for 17 years, because I can remember when I first started having the argument, look at the law of big numbers. They had 10, 12, 15% GDP growth when the economy was 700 billion, a trillion two, uh, two trillion. But now when you have a seven trillion, eight trillion dollar economy, 6% growth ain't bad, you know. It's, it's actually more growth than when you were, you know, when you had uh, 15% with a 700 billion economy. So they're still experiencing great growth. We just don't know because of the lack of, of transparency what the fragility, and this is the question I, I, I know that you're discussing, is how fragile is the Chinese financial system? And you know what? You can count electrical units. You can count whatever you want. You still don't know that answer. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But, but if I was a Chinese, I would get on my high horse a little bit too like they've been doing because when the global economy turned down twice, it was the Chinese who stepped into the void and really ramped up uh, cr uh, credit and, uh, and, and infrastructure spending to help stem the impact of the global slowdown. So they do, they're not without um, uh, their positives that they can argue to from that position. Uh, so, but again, we, do, we don't know. And, and anybody who says that they know, I run from right away because how, how could you know? I, how, what, what crystal ball do you have? What is it that you know is going well, on? Well, there what, is what one. Do you know? I've, I've read that their commercial, their commercial banking debt is like 80 something percent of GDP in the United States. It's like 35% of GDP. And, I, I, I and guess. I, and, guess. you know, I, I see, Chinese people pulling a hell of a lot of money out and buying properties in, the, in North America, and I think they're I think they're stripping it out of uh, the capitalization of companies that were that are kind of fake fake business models, and that's that's that's, that's, that's those are the dots I, I'm guessing, but I don't know for sure. I it's let me tell you that slowed down a lot because you don't want to be on the wrong side of uh, President Xi. If you're Chinese, you do not want to be on the wrong side. So where people were rushing out at one time to start transferring assets abroad, it's, it, it's slowed down quite a bit because they know who's doing what. And if you're doing it very phony pricing of, through corporate, through corporate um, buildings, they know what's going on. And, and they'll make your life very difficult, very, very difficult. So... Uh, I, I think there was that, but it, it's definitely slowed down. And everybody's trying to figure out where everybody is at. You know, we, we just don't know. But, you know, but going back to Russia, we also had a great, you know, uh, it, it was the summer of love, you know, between Putin and Xi. Wow. You know, I thought I was, I think I saw those two at Woodstock. It was the summer of love. So, uh, it's another thing favoring Russia was able to sign a lot of deals with uh, Chinese companies, especially in the energy area last week when they had that big meeting in St. Petersburg. Um, so all kinds of, there are so many things going on and yet the, you know, we continue to focus a very, very narrow focus, which is of course the tariffs and will the fed or won't the fed because we know how important that is, but there are many, many things as I keep stressing, going on here. Uh, and any one of them could really set events uh, in motion that, uh, that that could be very difficult for the uh, world to absorb. I mean, and, it's, and it is fragile, which goes back to my initial discussion, which is why the Fed might be better off making its cut and saying, hey, we're done for a while. You guys figure this out. You guys price everything in, but we're done. And and let the world sort through it and let everybody else sort through it. And you know what? They've, they've got to come to terms with, with Trump. And the Fed, the Fed has to do it too because 
he has the ability, you know, every time a Fed uh, governor or president talks about tariffs, doesn't that empower Trump? Because if he's trying to get the Fed to cut rates, <clears throat> as he used the tariff discussion to bludgeon Mexico, he can use tariffs to bludgeon the Fed. I mean, to me, that's, that's very logical. Yeah, he's always looking for an enemy. Yeah, he is. He, that, that's, that's exactly what he does. Uh, who's next? Who's next on my list? Who's next? Yeah. And then he goes, you know, and, he, and he embarks upon some policy that in which he, you, the one thing you have to give him cr great credit for, and he's very good at it, is that this man knows how to control the narrative better than any president I can I can remember. If we know the wants to change it, it changes. And the media, for all their, you know, all, you know, all their criticizing of him, they walk, they walk right in step with it. Oh, you know, because he throws out a tweet. And even the people who hate him show up to report it. So he has the ability to control that. And, and he does it expertly i mean if if he wanted to to go back to mexico today <laughs> you know and, and embark upon a the the tariffs all they're not meeting what they said they would meet that would become the discussion that would become and it's so uh it, it, it's so it's so distracting you know in the financial markets but everybody goes to it, it everybody goes to it he's been so good at it you, you do have to give him that because I think it's what he learned by doing The Apprentice or whatever, you know, show he had. He knows how the media works. He knows what attracts him. He, he knows where their bread and butter is and he goes right to it. Oh, well, and, they, and they follow. Yeah, he, he is. He is good at it. You know, what? You, you, he, he does understand that he's really an ex. He's more than he's he's good at it. Oh, he's, he's not good so at it. Distracted. I mean, I don't I don't like him, but he's great at it. Yeah, that's right. He is. You can't you cannot diminish it. And and unfortunately for all of us, the media just runs to it because they're afraid not to. You know, it's like not reporting a murder. Yeah, you, know, you know, you're of course three three stations in Chicago. My whole life, if one has it, they all have it. So. It's, everybody's afraid of being left out, and if they and if they don't run to it, then you've got these um, uh, social media sites that will report it, and everybody will be go running there. So they're all locked in, and he knows it, and he just plays them. Okay, here's a statement that just came out: Mexico, China to hold talks after G20. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, because. You know, again, China understands the importance of Mexico. I'm not sure that some people around the White House do, but I, I shouldn't say, you know, somebody understands it, but China certainly understands the importance of Mexico. And, and, and watch them start buying up those factories <laughs> on the southern border of the U.S. The, Mex the Chinese will own them all. Then what are they going to do? Oh, that's a good point. You know, the, the Mount you know, th that were built to, you know, for the supply, all of a sudden there's a Chinese. And, and let's go back to the Chinese debt situation. The Chinese also have massive amount of savings. So you can't take one without the other. Uh, so can they weather it? Again, we don't know. We don't have enough information. We have raw data, or we think we have raw data. Um, but it always raises the issue of, yeah, but it, what's the data worth? And again, I, I can't tell you. We don't know. And I, I love all these experts who tell you that they know because everybody's selling something. So they're all selling it. Well, I have the best data on China. You know, I have, I have this, I have that. Well, Ira, I like how Gary Schilling frames the Chinese data. What is that? what is Gary? You know, I I well, don't get his letters. So. 
Well, he, for years, right, he's been describing it as a large portion of China is still only accessible by ox cart, number one, okay? Number <laughs> yeah. two, at the end of the quarter, they report their, their GDP numbers and they never get revised, ever, okay? So right. the best you right. can, the, okay? And, and, I agree and, with so, that. And the that best, so, there, so therefore, the best you can do, right, is assume that there's consistency in the made-up numbers. That's the best you can do. And if you, you know, you, you measure, you measure the numbers as they come out and you just assume that the Delta stays the same, you know, now if the Chinese start changing the Delta of their made up numbers, you, you can just absolutely forget it. Completely forget it. You know, I, I didn't know that he said it, you know, but my, my view, you know, for China, and it's been my view for 20 years is that they, the, they get the Jack Welch uh, award because they hit their bogey every time. Oh, GDP 6.5%? Oh, it's 6.5%. <laughs> you know, it's like GE always made their number. Or if Hop it missed, Singh. It was Hop Singh, we want 6.5. Coming right up, sir. <laughs> they get 6. And that's it. It's 6.5. I go, in a country of that size, and, and, it's, and it, Gary Schoen says, you know, a lot of ox cart. Okay, I'll be kind, ox cart. How do you gather that type of data and be so accurate? Please, please. I, I, seriously, I know you extrapolate. I know, I know how, how to uh, gather data so you extrapolate. But, and people accept it. Okay, I know that's yeah. all you got, but okay. I, yeah, six times. China, they, wow, can you believe they hit their number? Wow, can you believe yeah. that? Yeah. There, there's That's a exactly his point. That's precisely yeah, his point, yeah. and, and that the data never, ever, ever gets revised. You know, so yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a joke. It's a joke. So you're right. You, you know, you, you, the best you can do is probably just monitor the activity of the peripheral countries, you know, in Southeast Asia, right? Yes, that's what I do. Yeah, especially Australia, you know, those are very important. You know, now, I, I don't know if uh, they're getting more sophisticated and they're sending up satellites to monitor, you know, electricity use or, or whatever, you know, satellite take, taking pictures during the night like they do of uh, North Korea. You know, and it's like the entire uh, yeah. country is completely dark at night. <laughs> well, you know, you had that one company, I forgot what their name, they're a, they're a research company who's They've they've measured electrical use. That's been their their big uh, point. Uh, that uh, and that's why they always maintain they were better because that's real numbers. Okay, so people I forget the name of the firm. I'm not looking to advertise for them, but they were supposed. To, and you know, I'd, I'd hear them come out. Uh, I, it may have been called Brenton uh, Brenton Wood. I don't know some some kind of name like that. And they oh yeah, we measure. Uh, uh, you know, the electrical use. That's how we're more accurate than everybody else. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I, how do I you know a guy, guy with a walk or a guy in a factory? Yeah. You know, like, like yeah, the, the data that's being handed to them is being handed to them by some Chinese guy, metaphorically speaking. Okay. Right. So how do you know that it's not made up before, you know, you get handed that, that information? You just don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I exactly. I, I have no idea. You know, but they all seem to be very comfortable with it. I'm never again. My my basis of of looking at China was if you don't allow Google to operate freely, I don't trust the thing that you have to say. And that's not to say I'm I, I'm not impressed with the Chinese miracle. I am absolutely. That's an impressive, uh, systemic event. What it, what's going on in China? But it doesn't mean I have to accept the data you're throwing out. Because if you, again, if you don't allow the free flow of information, it makes it, uh, hell, I have enough problem with the U.S. data. You know, I criticize it on a lot of ways. And, and I know that we're a lot more free here in, in our ability to, uh, to discuss things and, and operate around the Internet 
But when you prevent Google from operating, as they have for a long, long time, uh, it makes it very difficult to trust what you're trying to feed me as far as information. I, you know, and until proven otherwise, I know it's simplistic, but go ahead, prove me, prove it otherwise. For me, Ira, it's even simpler than that. All right? They're commies. That's all I need to know. <laughs> I know. Hey, I'm a commie. You trust me, right? I'm a commie. I'm, I'm an old card carrying commie. You got to, you know, I, I don't know. I don't go there. In fact, I, I there's a very interesting, um, it's funny that you say that. I go to this doctor in Arizona and uh, well, I'm having a physical a week, about six weeks ago. Yeah, was, uh, five weeks ago. I'm, I have with me a book I'm reading, and he sees it. And he goes, yeah, what is it that you do? I forget. So I told him. He says, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, it was a book from uh, written by, uh, I think I've told you guys, Lee Kuan Yew, who, is, who put together Singapore. Right. His son. His, uh, so, so the doctor says, he says, oh, he says, he says, you know, I have a patient you'd probably be interested in meeting. I said, really? I said, who is that? So he tells me his name. I go, he's still alive? He says, yeah, he's 96 years old. I said, I can't believe it. But this was this guy who was born in the United States in Charleston and uh, in 1943, 44, was sent by the U.S. military, even though he was a lefty. Because uh, he because he could speak uh, Mandarin, because he had learned it, uh, he was through the U.S. Army, and they sent him to China, and and he wound up with Mao. In fact, he wound up as a member of the Central uh, Committee. The Ch and uh, I, I I've known about this guy because when I was in uh, graduate school, I had a great professor for uh, Chinese politics, Ed Friedman, at, in Madison. And we had discussed this guy because I, I didn't believe a guy like this existed. So when he told me his name, he says, yeah, he's my patient. Iris, I said, I, graduate school. Yeah, I, I, I did. I wanted, I wanted to be a professor of, of political science and economics. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were really no jobs in 76, 77. So I pulled up and said, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> but I had a great professor for Chinese politics and uh, and this guy was a big time. So this guy lives in Scottsdale. And, and this guy did 16 years of solitary. It's a, there's an hour and 20 minute interview with him on YouTube of recent vintage. Cause the guy just wrote a book talking about the power of your mind as traders. You, we should all learn it, but I, I have to be, but this guy is, he did 16 years in Chinese prisons. Two different times, one four-year stint and one 12-year stint because he got on the wrong side of certain people. And um, so a very interesting guy, but I want to sit and talk to him. But then he came back to the States in 79, right, right after Deng Xiaoping took over because he was let out of prison. And, uh, and he, of course, became a consultant for U.S. corporations because he knows everything about China. I mean, this is the real deal. So... Uh, this is a guy who I would love to talk to and get his perspective because he's a walking encyclopedia. You know, you, you don't get to, to talk to somebody who's lived history like this. And the guy is phenomenally coherent because the YouTube, you can, I'm telling you, watch the YouTube, you go, oh, my God. This is, you know, phenomenal. Uh, the guy's name is uh, Sidney Rittenberg. He's from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, fascinating. Fascinating. Because he, he he was there, and he was there, when they, and, he, and he pissed him off enough that they threw him in jail, but he says that's because he was arrogant in his own right. So I like people who admit their own arrogance. It's, a, it's not a regular, regular site, but it was, it was really fascinating. And so it's really, the bottom line, it, it's always hard to know what goes on in China. And the point that, who was Angelo who said that, that you just watch the periphery of China and you get a much better feeling and, and you could see Australia and New Zealand yeah things have definitely slowed in China because you know they've slowed there except the economies are doing pretty well you know the unemployment rates are low but it's, they're still cutting rates and there's another reason you know when the Aussies cut uh, 
kind of uh, it kind of puts pressure on the Fed anyway, because again, everybody's cutting, and why are they cutting? To keep their currency under control. So uh, Thursday we have the Swiss National Bank uh, with their meeting. Uh, you you want to bet what the statement's going to say? They'll talk about the currency. Uh, they'll leave everything where it's at. And uh, and it's like they came out today. Well, we have room to move if we have to. If you know, if the because all they're doing is marrying the ECB. Any whatever the ECB does, they're forced into that situation. Otherwise, the Swiss franc, which has actually been performing <coughs> fairly well of late um, against the euro, but that that's what they're concerned about. So, again, currencies do matter. And they do affect their interest rates. So again, making and if I was Trump, I would be talking about the Swiss. Hey, what are you getting on me for? Why the Aussies just cut rates? Why did they cut rates? You know, he's got a lot of room to to maneuver there. Uh, why is the European Central Bank so? You know, they've got growth. They talk about you know what, what are they doing cutting rates? Uh, he's not that good on on his feet, uh, meaning Trump, so he can't respond to that. But I I, sh I certainly expect him to start uh, broaching those subjects because th he's go the dollar is g I can see what's happening here as he's setting up the f Commerce Department against the Treasury Department, and it's because he trusts Wilbur Ross more than Mnuchin. But he can I I don't think he can get rid of Mnuchin. I think uh, he would worry about the damage to the markets if uh, if he got rid of Mnuchin. Wall Street would become very suspect. But just. Just a just a hunch on my part. I can, pure conjecture. I I know nothing uh, except anybody, what I see. I, Ira, anybody figure anything out yet on Simon Potter? Nope. Jack, no discussion whatsoever. Um, I, hey, I put up Sidney uh, Rittenberg's name in here, and there's TED yeah. talks with him, and there's That's also the one. Things. It's a it's an hour and 20 minutes with that, that Dr. Doug Lakin. Yeah. Worth, I'm telling you, when you got some time, better than wasting and watching television, watch this guy. I, it's, it's, and I, I was really, I was really impressed. My wife was, who doesn't really like this stuff, sat and watched it. She says, wow, this is, when do you get this? I said, I got to arrange my next physical when he's in. I don't <laughs> care. Stick me with whatever needles you want. If I could sit in the waiting room and talk to the guy, I'd be, I'd be like, wow, wow. Well, whatever Simon Potter's doing, he's probably uh, sitting, he's set up pretty well because the New York Fed not only has a defined benefit pension plan, but they've got <laughs> yeah. an, it, 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 but Ira, they have an additional 8% match in the 401k. So you get a defined benefit and an 8%, 8% match in the 401k. Hey, you, you know what, you know what Jerome Powell would say? It's great to have a printing press. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and no and they get every other, they, they get every other Friday off. <laughs> they yeah, do. Is that right? They do. I, yeah. I know for a fact. Uh, uh, someone I know used to work at the New York Fed until a couple years ago. Well, see, that's the yeah. ad for the four-day work week. They just had a special on that about and productivity. I I was I was when I lived in New York when I was working with Owen Brown at Solaris Capital. The Fed called us in, so Owen says, "You go." So I went to Foreign Exchange Group, and they just wanted to know what we were thinking as a as a hedge fund, you know. I said, well, tell me what you're thinking. Oh, and I went over there with a guy from State Street, uh, John, uh, who, he, he came in from Boston for the meeting, and, uh, and he kept badgering them. He was badgering the guys from the Fed. And they go, we're not going to answer that. I said, well, why should I tell you what we're thinking? You're not giving us any answers. And of course we're not giving you any answers. And they told me this at lunch. Yeah, we're the Fed. I said, yeah, but I want to know what you're thinking. Not that I really want to know because it's not going to do me any good anyway. I said, tell me how you intervene. Oh, we don't intervene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, yes, you do. Yes, yes, you do. 
and tell me how you do it through your FX desk. Let me guess. You know, it's, it's interesting. It but the, right oh, Brian, in England, so it's not regulated. The, the guy's name was John Moore. He worked for uh, State Street. I don't know if he's there anymore. I don't think so because I used to get a lot of emails from him. And uh, he kept badgering them, badgering them. And they finally said, you know, we're not going to tell you anything. <laughs> I said, yeah, I kind of got that. Uh, I said, you're here to get and not to give. You want to know. You want you want to know everything everybody else knows. So, I think that's what they do a lot is that they'll call people in and say, hey, we just want to get a sense, which is smart. You should get a sense of of what the uh, trading community is doing. So you you know, and if you if you can get beyond your own uh, arrogance, say, hey, you know. We can learn something from them. Maybe they're onto something. But we'll see. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. That you know that. Wow, that's a that's a hell of a plan. They've they've got a juicy benefits package. Very I juicy. would say so. Yeah, I would say so. That's a uh, that's really a good package. And every other Friday off. Okay. And you know what? They don't take any risk. No, but they need nice. captain time in somebody's mansion. They're not going. To, that would be a. But it, but they they take no risk. They so if they go home with a position, it's a miscount. And what does it matter? So you know, it's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, but I want to you know. know you don't really that. think there's such a thing as a plunge protection team, do you? Well, you know, I, I, the only reason I've never bought into it is because it's so conspiratorial in nature. And I just don't accept conspir those conspiracy theories because they're too hard to keep a secret. You yes. know, people just yes. talk too much. That's why I don't accept it. I know, I, I know we, we can look at patterns. They got to be here. Yeah, I'm not necessarily, you know. I, I, I know it's gone on since the Reagan years. And that it supposedly exists, and I've read so much about it. I just, I, I just don't give into it because I just don't believe you could keep that secret. No, I, one, one way or another, right? Somebody who knows something, after he's long gone, retired, you know, has a couple of scotches too many. He's hanging out with his buddies, and something slips out of his mouth. It, it you you don't hear a word from anybody exactly right. So I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's my view. I know I know it's a it's a nice story and it fits well, but hey, the algos are just as capable of doing it on their own now. You know, how you can you can shift these gears. Uh, I, I love to listen to Kramer rail about it because they upset some of his calls. And went, like this morning, he was real. He must. I don't watch CNBC much. You know, I was in the office, so I was listening in the background. But I never have it on at home. I'll put on Bloomberg Radio. Um, but I was listening. He must have really gotten whacked around because he was he was bitching about uh, Beyond Meat. He was he, he he was bitching about everything. I go, wow. He must have really had some bad calls. He's in a bad mood. Well, I don't watch that period. I have to turn it off. I can only watch the quotes go by. Yeah, I, I know. I, you know, it's just, I put it on sometimes just for the headlines at times. You know, if, if you know, Drucker Miller's on, sounds up. Kramer's on, yeah, right. he sounds up. up. He's on in the yeah, morning I now with Kernan. It, it, I, I, it's so inane, I can't listen to either of them. I just turn it off. I mean, Drunken Miller's interview that he did uh, last week, last was it? Week. Or the week before? Yeah, last yeah, week. At, at the, yeah, at the, uh, the Economic Club of New York. That's, the, you know, it's on YouTube and it's in, in its entirety, you know, and yeah. you don't get, uh, you don't get, you know, bozos like, uh, like Kernan or Becky Quick interrupting him. You know, you're able to I, get his complete thoughts to a question. I know. Pe Becky Quick has to get her, you know, giggles in. So she can make you know, uh, <laughs> you know, let him he, told talk. Her to, he told her to clam up. He said, don't even yeah. ask me about that. I said, I can walk out of here in 30 minutes from now. My book could be totally different than what I say right now. Yeah, right. he did say that. Yeah, I, I, I heard that. That's why I say, you know, but that's what they're, 
that's what they're programmed to ask. You know, it's it, it's like I can't listen to Andrew Ross Orkin. Do you think that's going to make stocks go up? Uh, you know, what, what do you? Wait a minute. What do you? That's your only concern about? Ira, when you're when you're doing those quick little things with Santelli, like yeah, how how are you able to like get your point across in in thirteen words or less? I try. I try my best. Uh, uh, depends upon what you know where we're at, but and, and there's no prep to that. You know, he, all he does is read the blog, so he knows what I think. He's known me long enough to have a fairly sound idea of where I'm going. Uh, and and if he wants to talk about Europe, which he loves to do with me, because I'm a good uh, source for that. Uh, and he knows it, and I'll bring up views, you know, and I'll go after Draghi, which, you know, he can't do. Uh, you know, they're all put in a position because you can't alienate. You know, it's like when he has Jean-Claude Trichet on. Uh, not a big fan of Jean-Claude Trichet. Uh, it goes back a long way. But they have to be careful, and I understand that. I, 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 you, you, know, you can't they, ask they need him for his black book, Ira. You can't ask him for his Rolodex, for his phone numbers? No, 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 no. no and, you know, I mean, Ira, is there, their, is there a reason why you go through the trouble? You know what, because I like Rick, and I, you know what, I like the exposure, because it, I thought it would get me somewhere, it doesn't really, because it's amazing how little influence CNBC has. You know, if I go, when I started doing this with Rick, you know, I, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, um, maybe even longer, I, you know, you'd be places, people, you know, if I was on Wall Street, people would stop and talk. And uh, Nobody's watching. I go through places now, you know, you go, no, I go, wow, nobody. It's true. And Zero, Zero Hedge loves to go after CNBC, you know, with their declining uh, uh, viewers. You know, and the reason that CNBC still stays on, they go to Zero because they're part of the cable package. So they get paid regardless. That's true. Because, well, I never knew that, you know, because I said, wait a minute, viewership is way down. I see, and uh, I had it explained to me that they're getting their money from every, you know, Comcast and everybody else. Anybody who picks up CNBC, you pay, that's part of your package you pay for. So they're getting paid regardless, which is why, which is why they've become a, um, a circus. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's you can't. I mean, I can't personally watch it. Period. No, I and and everybody I know who I respect, they turn the sound down, and it's only there in case there's a breaking news, so you can turn and look at it. You know, so you're not attentive to something else, because you know the that's they break stories, but everybody will tell you that, and they turn it up to listen to Cashin or Santelli. But if it's Santelli and Leesman screaming at each other. That doesn't sell. Uh, the only ones it sells for is for them. Um, like it, seriously, it is, Leesman, a guitar playing history major. Oh, you seriously? know what? He was he was probably as good as he ever was this morning, and because he was actually going to, you know, Steve Moore. He had to be ke- careful with Steve Moore on there because he had to respect him, and Steve Moore could hold his own, and 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 cut the rug out from under Leesman. So Leesman was actually good because he was going towards the point. And of course, Kernan cut it off with a stupid comment. And, and then Becky had, you know, and that, that took care of that. Conversation ended. He jumped to a commercial. It's just pathetic. I go, you, you guys are missing the whole point. You were actually going somewhere where somebody might want to hear. It's all sound bites. So. Yeah, and, you know, I used to do a lot. I used to do a lot of that stuff. But when I went after uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin on, on an issue one day, and Simon Hobbs and I got into it well years ago, uh, when he was still on, uh, and I called him out on something, and he said, and he said, well, and I said, no, you're wrong. You're just wrong. You, you want me to cite? And I cited why he was wrong, and that was it. <laughs> I was never on that show again. You know that's what they do. They don't. They don't want to. They don't want to hear it, unless unless you have enough zeros after your 
after your ones. Then they then they will hear it because they need you. You know, again, my daughter taught me that about access journalism. You know, you have to have access. If you blow your access, uh, you could really be in a bad situation. So that's that's why they don't do certain things. Because you, you watch, they bring people, certain people on, you never see them go after them, ever. They can say whatever David they Tepper, want. David Tepper will say anything he wants. Yes. Uh, Which is fine. It, yeah. You know and and, like Dr- and Drunken Miller, too, says whatever he wants. Yeah, well, and yeah, he tells them to shut up, and he's speaking, which is even... Yeah. <laughs> it, although, it was funny to watch Le- to watch Leesman disagree with Drunken Miller. That was fucking funny. I'm going, wait a minute. A guy who has no skin in the game, who is sitting there giving an opinion, and you and Drunken Miller, who throws, who backs whatever he thinks up with his money, and you're, well, because he said to him, you know, he says, "Well, I disagree." I, yeah, you can, but I don't care if you disagree. If you disagree, then raise a point. Just don't tell me you disagree. If you disagree with Drunken Miller, you better have the goods. Yeah, for sure. He does his homework. You know, he said something oh, interesting yeah. last week. Um, Only he one commented, thing? He, he commented about how he made 70% of his money in years past, you know, trading bonds and currencies. And right. I, I would suspect, Ira, that, you know, you probably feel the same way, that it was easier back then. I don't know, easier, but just different. It was easier to sustain a move. And I think Judd would say that moves got sustained because they were driven by fundamentals. This market is, has not been driven by fundamentals. 08 and 09 was. 10, 11, yes. But since, since we've had these algorithmic headline readers coupled with other types of algorithmic tra- trading and this passive type investing, these are not fun. Now you could say, well, yes, the market goes up on fundamentals. It, it does, but you get a lot of uh, noise that disrupts what was an easy fundamental run. That, that's the way that I would put it. When the dollar started going down, it started going down because there was, there was a major shift in, in perception and reality about the underlying fundamentals. You don't get that today. You get, you know, again, a lot of it is driven by risk parity. A lot of it is driven. The biggest play going on, and and I think it's the Fed. The Fed is underestimating the potential of a blow up in in volatility and what it will mean to a lot of a lot of positions out there. I I, I believe they are underestimating. It. I think Powell woke up to it in January with the pivot because he said, "Wow, uh, December was a very painful month on a lot of balance and a lot of." financial balance sheet there's something bigger here but it's gotten lost and it still sustains itself so those types of players really are are counter actors to any type of sustained move and that's why i think guys like drucken miller and tudor they've closed up uh, or they're they've scaled down because they've been impacted by it because that's the way that they've always traded hey i've done my work here this is what i see it doesn't sustain itself. Will it? I believe. That's why you and I are, that's why I'm talking to this group. I still think that this does play out because you cannot hide the fundamentals. And I will leave you again with what Keynes so famous many years ago, which is markets can remain irrational far longer than you and I can remain solvent. And I, I really think that holds today because I think the market's, from a fundamental position, are very irrational. But it's not, we've seen this before. It's, we, we've seen it. And with low interest rates, the ability to sustain irrational markets is, is great. It's great until it's not. You know, Ira, the one thing I liked most about Drunken Miller was he said, I don't know. How many times did he say, I don't it, know? In that it, exactly. You've you got to love a guy of that stature. I don't know. I don't know. The other thing about him is he was talking about he had done that like weeks ago, and he will turn huge positions on a dime, big ones. Yep. Well, he stays in – you know what? He preaches 
what what I've always believed, and I and I know Judd preaches to you guys, you have to stay in liquid investments. You know, these guys who go looking to illiquid investments, they're only doing it so that they can sustain a performance. So on their quarter end, they can mark the books. You know, yes, I know that there's opportunities in illiquid investments, but not for what a lot of not if you're a hedge fund. Then you then you may as well be a private equity group. But if you're a hedge fund, if I ran a hedge fund, I and I always said one of the biggest selling points would be that you can get out today. If you called me and said liquidate my account, I should be able to do it today. If not, at least tomorrow. Because I think everything some of these guys in, are so big, Ira, they can't. Oh, I especially those who are out there selling vol, a lot of these vol trades, you can't. You can't. And the Fed is, that's where the Fed is really erred because by, you know, the sustaining the low interest rates, it just keeps blowing up those positions, meaning enlarging. I don't mean blowing up. I, I mean enlarging those positions where they're so massive. They're massive. Trillions upon trillions upon trillions of notional value. So big, we can't even comprehend it. Listen, even Buffett, you know, 20 years ago, called them weapons of mass destruction. All right. I think we covered enough ground. We'll, there's, but I watched this dollar stuff here with the White House and the Fed. Okay, and I'm going to leave you with that. Okay, guys. Thanks, Ivor. Thanks right. again. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right.